Where the Bright Waters Meet by Harry Plunkett Green Chapter 4 The Finest Trout in the River It might naturally be supposed that if one had the fishing of a trout stream like the Bourne, one would not leave an inch of it unexplored. But it was a fact that up until this time, none of the rods had ever taken the trouble to investigate the top quarter mile of the water. Savage and Sharky had somehow got it into their heads that there was nothing worth troubling about above the lagoon, immediately beyond the viaduct. And as they lived close to the top of the fishing, all the rest of us, myself included, had tactically accepted this as a matter of fact. Nowadays, the whole of the region is a vast watercress bed, and anyone looking out of the window of the train when passing over the viaduct would never realise that there was, or ever had been, a river there at all. But in those days there were two streams above, as well as below the bridge, meeting a little way up and stretching as one for a quarter of a mile to the end of the fishing. We had all of us come on occasions as far as the hatch below the final stretch, but in the belief that the water above was a blank, we had always turned back when we had got there. On the 31st of August of this year, the last day of the season, I find myself at this hatch at about six o'clock in the evening. I had got four fish averaging one pound and a quarter, but it had been a bad rising day, cold and windy. At six o'clock it suddenly turned warm and calm, and I was sitting on the hatch smoking a pipe before going home, when I thought that, just for fun, I would walk up to the end of the water. I had expected nothing, and had half a mind to leave my rod behind and saunter up with my hands in my pockets. I got over the fence and strolled up onto the bank unconcernedly, and, as I did so, from one weed patch after another, there darted off a series of two-pounders racing upstream like motorboats. I dropped like a stone, but the damage was done. I just sat there, cursing the day I was born and myself, not only for having lost the chance of a lifetime, for the iron blues were beginning to come down thick, but for having left this gold mine undiscovered and untouched for two years, and today was the last day of the season. If there had been any handy way of discovering, of kicking oneself physically as well as mentally, I should have been unrecognisable when I got home. Every fish was under the weeds long ago, and I might just as well pack up my traps and clear out. There was an old broken down footbridge, about a hundred yards above me, and I thought I would go up to it and explore the reach beyond, more with a view to the possibilities of next year than with any hope for the present. I got down from the bank and circled round through the meadow till I got to it and was just picking my way across its rotten planks, when under my very feet I saw a small nose appear, followed by a diminutive head and the most enormous shoulder I ever remember to have seen in a chalk stream. I froze stiff where I stood, except that my knees were shaking like aspens, for there... Right underneath me was gradually emerging the fish of my life. I do not mean to say that I have not caught bigger fish before and since, but this was a veritable star in the dust heap, a Cinderella stealing out of the kitchen that we had all despised. And the romance of the thing put him on a pedestal of fame from which I had never taken him down. It was agonising work, for he swam up in the most leisurely way, at a rate of about an inch every five seconds. While I was straddled across two rotten planks, either of which might have given way at any moment, and I had to pretend that I was part of the landscape, he was immediately under me when he first showed up, and I could have easily touched him with my foot. What fish will see? and what they will not see, will ever remain a mystery. It was about half past six, the time of day when one's visibility is most clear, and yet he took not the smallest notice of me. 
he just strolled up the middle of the stream contentedly, as though he were having a smoke after dinner. I can still feel my joints creaking as I slank slowly to my knees and got my line out. It fell just right, and he took no more notice of it than the water rat. I tried again and again, lengthening the cast as he moved up, and at last he rose towards it, examined it carefully, and, horror of horrors, swam slowly after it downstream through the bridge under my feet. It would have been laughable if it had not been so tragic. There I was, pulling in the slack like a madman, and leaving it in wisps round my knees, scared lest he should see my hand move, and he passed by me without a word and disappeared into the bowels of the bridge. I just knelt there and swore, trying to look over my shoulder to see if he'd gone down below. There was no sign of him, and the situation was painful in the extreme, for my knees were working through the rotten woodwork. And if I tried to ease myself, I should either bring the bridge down with a crash, or anyway evict Cinderella for good and all. I bore it as long as I could and I was just going to give up and scramble out anyhow, when I saw that nose slide out again beneath me, and my old friend started off on his journey upstream once more. I began on him with a shorter line this time, and he took the fly at the very first cast like a lamb. If he was a lamb when he took it, he was a lion when he had it. Instead of running upstream, as I hoped and expected he would, he gave one swish with his tail and bolted down through the bridge, bending the rod double and dragging the point right under. It was done with such lightning speed, I had no time to remonstrate. I threw myself flat on my stomach and got the rod sideways over the bridge, and then the fight began. I was on one side of the bridge, and he was halfway to Southampton on the other. He got further and further downstream, going from one patch of weeds to the next, and digging and burrowing his nose into the middle of it, while I just hung on, helpless, waiting for the end. He quietened down a bit, and, finding that he could not rub the annoying thing out of his nose on the south side, he determined to explore the north and he began to swim upwards towards me. I must have been a ridiculous sight, spread-eagled on the rotting planks, with splinters digging into my legs and ants and spiders crawling down my neck. Vainly and devouring to hold the rod over the side with one hand, to wind in the line with the other, and to watch him over my shoulder all at the same time. Fortunately, I must have been invisible from below, but the moment he got under the bridge he saw the rod and tore past me upstream with the real screaming. But now we were on even terms, and there was a clear stretch of water ahead, and I was able to play him to a finish. I was really proud of that fight, for, in the addition to the cramped style which I was compelled to adopt, it took place in a stream ten feet wide, half choked with weeds, and I got him on a triple O iron blue at the end of a four X point. He weighed three and three quarter pounds when I got him home, and I have always bitterly regretted that I did not get him set up, for... With the exception of an eleven and three-quarter pounder in the hall of Longford Castle, caught in the Avon by one of the family on a local lure, the name of which neither fork nor spade would dig from me, he was the most beautiful river trout in shape, colour and proportion that I ever saw.' 